The Celtic Exchange, a fresh insight on Celtic Football Club. The 2-1 defeat in Sunday's Scottish Cup semi-final was the first time Ange Postacoglu's Celtic had lost domestically since September. Was it a sore one to take? Absolutely. But should it take away our focus on the priority that is the Scottish Premiership and the progress we've made these last 10 months or so? Absolutely not. This is episode 65 of the Celtic Exchange Weekly. This is Tino and this week I'm joined by James and Paddy to cover all things Celtic. Paddy, sore one to take at Hamden as I've mentioned. What's your initial thoughts on it and on the bigger picture just now? Yeah, obviously we we don't like uh, losing in semi finals. No one does um, to your to your your, your biggest rivals. Um, it's not the yeah, it's not what you what you want. Um, especially, I think a game we're going into with a lot of confidence. Um, but yeah, a, a few things that we need to take from it. Um, for me, it doesn't rock the boat too much. Um, I've seen some some crazy takes on social media about um, you know this could be a beginning of a derailment no I don't I don't see it the Ange train's still going and it's going to arrive and take this title for us um, we've been playing well above where we, we should be this season and I just think that's just a wee blip on the road so yeah upsetting but we keep going yeah I agree with that Twitter's been an absolute riot isn't it? Panic stations I think it I think it kind of comes for me with what, what, what I was kind of saying to some of the guys last night. We've, we've been very much spoiled in the last few seasons, um, especially the last six domestically we've been incredible. Um, that was what, 17 games unbeaten at Hamden, a stadium which we all thought we had a bit of a, a hoodoo in, um, a bit of a, a, like, a place we'd never ever liked playing. There was always something going to happen against us. That for me is still totally gone. Um, I, I just think that we just need to kind of ground ourselves a bit and realise what this team's achieved this season. Not in the last six years, this season and the, the overhaul that we had last summer. Yeah, and we'll get into that in some detail shortly. James, we were at the game together yesterday. What's your own feelings 24 hours on? Very relaxed about it. You know, disappointed that we didn't get the result, of course, and I was gutted yesterday. I saw one, like you said. Um, but a bit of perspective and taking into context, as Paddy's saying, with the, the broader nature of the season, what the work that had to be done by Ange, you know, the, the, the state we were in when he picked up the reins. So all I wanted this year was a league. That's looking good, while it's not being done. And um, we've got a League Cup bonus. So a Vim Janssen style season, I'd be more than happy with that, with a manager staying on. Uh, so Scottish Cup, it only really came into my focus in the last few weeks. When we beat them at Ibrox, I thought, there's actually a treble on here now. And my focus started to look at it. But until then, wasn't interesting at all. It was all about getting the league. So where are we? We're certainly looking good for the league. We've got a League Cup in the bag. So pretty happy. We'll take it. So on the day, ultimately I think over the piece and we'll get to the, the bones of it, but ultimately I don't think we've done enough to win it, despite some, let's call it very questionable refereeing at this point. We'll get to him in a bit. <laughs> um, I've got a list. <laughs> he'll, he'll have his bit. But we, uh, we certainly fell short, I think, of the, the high standards we've set so far this season. So I watched the game back today and oh, yes, oh, yes. Good, good luck with that. The whole 120. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. We didn't reach high standards. Uh, I thought for the first half an hour we were playing our own game. There was a lot of good interlinking, passing movement. The system seemed to be working. It was at that point the refereeing decisions kicked in. And you can't play your game against a team that's been allowed to be so physical against you. So I've always said I don't mind teams being physical against us, but the referee's got to play his part there and do his job. He didn't, which totally, totally derailed their plans. Now, that might mean... Ange and the boys need to look at something in terms of when that does happen, then we do this. Mm. That's the learning for me rather than we didn't really play that well because we, we were coming on our game when we get kicked off our game. Yeah. As I say, there's a whole section on that, so don't don't you worry. We'll get to that. <laughs> uh, that's, that's it'll, chunk, it'll, be peppered, it'll be peppered through the episode. Um, before going into all that, Paddy, so, I mean, just in terms of, let, let's let's get the kind of, you know, the match detail at the road and what, what went not much went right, but what went wrong and, you know, some of the specifics on it. I mean, first off, what about team selection? Personally, when the team comes out, I'm happy enough with that. There was the debate whether it would be Roger O'Reilly, would Kyogo get the start? And hindsight's a wonderful thing, but Ange doesn't have have the benefit of that when he's picking that team. What did you think of the team that started the game and, and how it started to play out? The starting 11 is strong enough to get the victory against Rangers. Simple as that for me. I don't think, uh, yeah, there could be a couple of changes. There could be Kyogo there. There could have obviously, if, if, if he was fit, uh, we'd have had Jack and Marcus. But that's, that start 11 yesterday is strong enough to go and get the victory. What they weren't strong enough at yesterday for me 
and they weren't coy enough is I thought Rangers were very very clever um, and every decision they made in the first half they slowed the game down as best as they possibly can probably thinking about well, obviously the, the the game they had on the Thursday with the 120 minutes that they played but they were so 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 clever in stifling us and that's where we got frustrated yesterday and I, I just think that's been what we have not been ready for sadly yeah. I've seen James Tavernier coming over to take, coming over to take a couple of corners. Yeah, he was moonwalking. Clever. He, he yeah. was just dragging his heels. And no nudge for the ref. Yeah. No, no, none. You've got that. And listen, I also think so. I'm going to talk about Hatati here. There's this whole thing about how he's just too nice a guy. He's picking guys up and he's patting them in the head and all that stuff. And I'm not asking him to fundamentally change his personality, which is clearly a nice, respectful young man. But there's gamesmanship, which is you know within the game and, and it's acceptable. Don't be Atletico Madrid. Don't be Rangers either. But you can be a wee bit more and savvy and a bit more streetwise. And I yeah. think Celtic lacked about that yesterday. Yeah, and that, that does give teams a psychological edge. Um, whether that affected Hatati personally, I don't know. But I think there's a that can spread throughout a team that, oh, you know, they're, they're dominating us in terms of aggression and not standing up to that. But you've played in teams yourself before where you've got a guy who isn't that guy and he's getting picked on. It's his teammate's job to stand up from not necessarily that guy himself. So that's where I thought we were lacking. Where's the big guys? Where's Carter Vickers? Where's Calmack to get around the, the aggressors there? There is a question that we lacked physicality in the starting lineup. So I think it was at Livingston where Ange put Ralston back in the team mm -hmm. instead of Juranovic and, and we reaped the rewards on that day. I still think with the benefit of hindsight, you wouldn't start Ralston over Juranovic yesterday with all due respect to Tony Ralston who's been doing really well. Mm -hmm. Overnight, Beaton's become a superstar again. The cries between last night and today for get Beaton in there. Beaton must start at Ross County. Beaton's the, the be all and end all. We need him in the midfield to get McGregor forward. Again, you know, that this is what we do. Hindsight is our job, you know, do, doing these shows. But I'm not sure, you know, starting Ralston and Beaton, for example, would have made a huge difference. I thought about four up until we lost Juranovic and then uh, Taylor after. I thought about four actually handled everything fairly easily yesterday. It was injuries, yeah. Yeah, it's the injuries sure. that have hit us. Um, I think our midfield let us down yesterday for me. Um, McGregor was doing a lot of running for both Atati and and for Rogic. Um, and if you know if you don't if you don't show up in the game, I'm not all. For, I get the total thought process of of players being aggressive and in people's faces. I understand that element of it. I do think that's an old element of football, though. I think on a technical basis, if you've got three players that are very technically good with the ball, and it's up to them to show that. Um, whether they were a bit spooked from how much Rangers were getting on on top of them, that's where we find out who's going to be good enough for our team, mm -hmm. personally. Um, I don't like saying that it all comes down to who was more physical on the day. I think that we sh our football should have done the talking yesterday, and it didn't. The midfield were very, very slow and getting the ball out of their feet and getting the, the, the through balls that Maeda was crying out for, and then Furuhashi to an extent in the, in the second half. Um, for me, I just think that we kind of lost our way a wee bit when we started having to shift about our defence and it just looked it just looked very disjointed from us. I agree with that. I mean, I think to a huge extent, though, even I was talking to somebody at half-time and I just didn't think we'd got our own game going at all. The whole playing for the back thing, risky as it is, Celtic have continued to do that throughout the season, even when it's looked a bit dodgy. We didn't do it yesterday. We didn't take the chances and more often than not, uh, Joe Hart just put the laces through it and cleared these lines and we started again. We had several high balls, early bells to Maeda and latterly to Kyogo, um, you know, going long and going high. And those two lads up against Goldson, that's a non-contest. Why do you think we resorted to that yesterday? Why do you think that happened? Because, as Paddy's saying, the, the midfield was letting us down. I mean, the midfield was essential to that passing out for the back because they need to show. Um, again, having watched the back today, there was probably more of it than you thought, yeah. you know. Um, there was quite a lot of playing out from the back, quite comfortably in tight positions. But it was only Carmack that was coming to you know, f fill the hole kind of thing. Um, Rogic, you know, I think Rogic is a you know, fantastic player. He's been yeah. a fantastic player for so long and will be, you know, again after yesterday. He was just off it and sometimes you need to say, this isn't working on 20 minutes. I know you don't sub again 20 minutes, but it was like, right, that's got to change soon because we were bypassing that. I thought Atati was off as well. Yeah. You really only had McGregor in there doing all the work. So you can't link back to front when you've got three guys or two of your midfield three guys not linking it simple as that one of the guys in our group chat James mentioned that back in the day Jack Charlton took Liam Brady off in a first half should we <laughs> resort to Jack's <laughs> tactics take him off and just go along to Andy Townsend or I mean it, it was one. never going to be Rogic's day so you could have done that but there's a, an impact on the players psyche thereafter yeah, so you I need don't to be careful with that, that. No, yeah. look at Andy Halliday's career after that 
Uh, never recovered. No. The um, <laughs> the, the, just not going to dive right into that one. Buddy. <laughs> the thing with Rodic, he's so adept at taking the ball on the half turn. That's his thing. He was taking it fully with his back to Rangers goal yesterday. In his defence, he, he's been manhandled. He's mm. been pulled and fully. dragged around, whether it be from uh, Aribo at times in Bassey. And I'm tempted to get the referee stuff just now because that's where the ref can have his impact. But I agree. I just think it looked like from an early stage that Rodic wasn't going to have that kind of game. Um, potentially just making the swap at half time like he'd done against Ross County might have been a move. But you never. And, and, you know, we got what we got. In terms of just generally speaking, you know, open play, very few chances created. I actually think both keepers had very little to do. Yeah, two, two shots on target each. Very frustrating from the fact that they're playing their second choice goalie and we've hardly, you know, stung his palms with anything um, and even the goal we've scored it's a, it's a well worked goal but it's a set piece you know it's something we've worked on it's worked really well Miff will be delighted that Greg <laughs> Taylor's got a goal there it's the first man I thought of but an open play we just we weren't doing our thing at all see the funny thing about the goal and I hope, I hope you're listening to this Miff I don't think the pass was meant for Taylor it was meant for <laughs> do you know that yeah. right? um, but it was well worked actually very quickly I, I clocked uh, Jota take the ball Bounced it twice, like a wee signal that they were going to try that. Right. Um, very clever from them. Um, a really, really good goal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't think the ball, the pass was met for Taylor, but he done well. he done well <laughs> Do with the finish. Cal Mike played it to him and went, oh, what, 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 <laughs> no, let go, let it go. Can we do that <laughs> again? <laughs> doing there? Yeah. It's funny though, because um, there's two hours of football, 120 minutes of football, and the only goal we scored is from a set piece. So, Positive, mm -hmm. a set piece is working out. Mm -hmm. Negative, you're not doing anything in open play. Even corner kicks, there was a corner kick. I need to check. I don't know if I can bear watching it back, James, like you've done, but I don't know if it was at one each or if after we conceded the goal. We've won a corner. I think it's still one each in the game. We've won a corner. Um, I think it's the first half of extra time. We've played it short. We've returned it to Jota and the oh, return pass has been out. ran yeah, out of the yeah. park. Yeah. The, 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 they just seemed fragile yesterday with stuff like that. Again, I just, I, I honestly just think it's just been one of those days. Unfortunately, it's happened in a semi-final for us. I, we've, we've played a lot of short corners this season but, um, and I think it works better for us with players running on to the ball from the ball getting whipped in instead of a static corner I think uh, I think it does work better for us and I get why they do it but yeah it just just didn't work for us yesterday at all yeah what about the question of fitness I think it's fair to say we didn't look particularly fit or fresh you know across the, the 120 minutes I think even the subs coming on you know people will talk about James Forrest and he was flagging for that second goal. You Even know. Wells looked tired as well. Yeah, I, and I wonder if it's if that's more a mental fatigue than a physical fatigue. You know that way where you can get an extra time, but if you score a goal all of a sudden, you've got that extra lift and you're charging around. Likewise, when the chips are against you, you're not quite at it. What do you think, Paddy? We've obviously physically had that week to prepare for it and whatever they do at Lennox Town to make sure the guys are in the best condition. But there is also an argument in Cal Mac referenced it in his post-match that sometimes having the momentum of just being Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday keeps you tuned in and yeah. keeps you up in terms of match fitness. Well, I actually mentioned that kind of when we came in to, to Dave. Um, I was saying to him about that when we basically had those two games, the match fitness is peak, you know, it's constant and, and the training's possibly a bit lighter as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it's one of those ones like, yeah, we, we, we've we spoke on this show how grateful we are probably about getting a game like only every seven days, but there maybe is something in the the thinking of like the momentum's totally calmed down from playing twice a week. Um, players being on their toes, match ready to go, mm -hmm. and then the training's maybe just been too much. Um, the boys had a go at me last night on the group. Um, I, I was being a bit more coy and looking into things a bit more. I watched uh, Hearts Hibs on Saturday and I thought that the park looked extremely slow. I thought it was like... It was very, very, the ball wasn't running fast on it at all. And when I, I seen Hamden yesterday, I actually think the, gla the grass looked fairly, fairly longer than expected. And I just wonder if that just slows you down a bit, makes you work a bit harder on it. I'm not saying this as an excuse. I just think, is that part of the, the, the engines getting burnt out a bit quicker? Small things like that. There's, there's easy fixes on that kind of thing. It's, it's looked to, you know, football excellence and say, how do you cut your grass mm -hmm. and just cut it like that and take it to be out? You, you've spoken in the past. So it, it's a small thing, Paddy, but it's a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of a bigger mm -hmm. picture, you know, some players not at their best, possible team selection. Loads of things going on yesterday. Robert Madden, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, but, the, you know, those factors, James, you've mentioned before, um, Brendan Rodgers, I think. Rodgers and Levine at Hearts. Yeah, when, when Rodgers was here, he said there should be a kind of standard of excellence. The grass should be X mil, whatever it is. And guys like Rodgers are perfectionists, but they're also 
top level. You know, they they look to make what, what can make the, the game you know the best possible uh, spectacle, football. the best export. And Scottish football just doesn't follow that. So not it, even interested in it. It's another wee thing, but listen, if, that, if that's the call for the day, we're in real trouble if that's what I know. We're, <laughs> we're calling for. This might get memed. Uh, <laughs> just, just clip that bit where they're talking daft about the grass. <laughs> um, in terms of Ange, so I, obviously there's been a lot of reactions, you know, on Twitter. And a few told you so merchants and then they're always great to read, you know, the, the day after. Personally, you know, you guys can tell me your own thoughts. 100% behind Ange and, and there's a whole bigger uh, picture at play with him. But it's still okay to question some of the calls he made. You, mm-hmm. know, you can question some of the subs, you know, a lot of folk question James Forrest coming in. Could Hitati have come off earlier on? Why have spare centre halves, but you don't have full backs? Why Stephen Welsh going to right back? All these kind of things, you know, it's okay to question that while still being fully behind the guy. Absolutely. You know, no deviation in my support for Ange, and you, you need to work really hard to dent it, to be honest with mm-hmm. you. Um, in terms of the subs, I think that's it's fair to look at those things when they are tactical subs. A lot of the subs were injury enforced. Yeah. So you can't really look at that. Do you think he's woke up the, yesterday morning and went, at some point I'm going to put Welsh on a right back? I'm going to throw Welsh <laughs> on Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah so, exactly. nah, just, just calm down and all that. You know, Ralph's never going to go left back. Ralph's did great when he came on, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Welsh is getting, you know, a hard time on online and stuff. Absolute madness. I'll judge Welsh as a centre half and nothing else. Plus, I'll judge him when James Forrest shows for the ball, when Welsh is trying to come out with, with two guys on him. Joke, man. I kind of felt that in the first half as well, by the way, with uh, Jaranovic and Abada. I thought Abada was way, way higher up than, than normal, to be honest. Um, and sometimes with Jota as well, I felt that the two of them, albeit that just maybe where they're told to be, and mm-hmm. we're not getting it out quick enough, that could obviously come into it as well. But, you know, if you notice that your midfield isn't able to receive the ball, you drop back and help. And I just didn't think For, we were getting was, that. Forrest was goal, goal side when Welsh was coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that a few times. I mean, no, you're right. Or the one who played it right out. And he's looking at Forrest like, come on, give yeah, me an option. Yeah, yeah. And I think for Stephen Welsh's point of view, and a few other players as well, he's he's a young guy. When did we last see Stephen Welsh kick a ball? Like, uh, would you, Alkbar, maybe? Well, he's had a wee bit since then. Not much. But yeah, l- limited game time this season very much. And then all of a sudden you put him into a pressure situation, Aye. up against that, out with his natural position. And then you've got all the the experts calling him out. He'll never make it in different things. As you say, let's judge him when he gets a run, he plays centre half. He might not get that run. He might move on. Yep, you cannot maybe. fairly judge the young guy based on a right back. I, I can agree. I, I said when Welsh was getting the earlier games this season, that I just didn't think he was ever going to make the grade for us. But maybe. I mean, yeah, yeah, maybe. But I de- definitely to, to have a go at him yesterday is a bit, yeah, is a bit poor in comparison. Um, I thought that, it had to be done, obviously, with the injury. I think, um, if I'm right in saying, I'm pretty sure Tony Ralston actually, a lot of his younger days at Celtic, he was training and playing at left-back to help out because he had two good right, okay. right-backs at the time. So that's something that I think that they were comfortable about moving him over to. Mm-hmm. Um, but we just looked so disjointed when those changes had to be made. And and I don't know about you guys, when this, the second half kind of kicked in the extra time, I was thinking to myself, I don't see how we're going to push it, push on here because they looked so nervous then at the back. Mm-hmm. No, it's something I never do, but at the start of the uh, first period extra time, mm-hmm. seeing the changes and seeing the, the change in, in shape and structure yeah. there, I said to my dad, I said, I take penalties, you know. Aye, aye. A lot of folk were saying that and I wonder, it's just a, a throw out here, but I wonder if I moved to something like a three-five-two would have been the move. Risky, you aye. You could have put Welsh, wake up. Makes Welsh more Starfield comf- comfortable. And have a go because I think... Extra time, it just looked like we were spent. Aye, we were mm-hmm. done at that point. Aye. So, ah, who knows? Yeah. And Ange isn't going to, maybe he'll say, I can't go 3 5 2. I work 4 3 3 all day, every day. Yeah, true. And maybe he doesn't have that option. It's another factor that we're still in the early stages of this new team as well, though. You know, yeah. the depth's still fully not there. We think it is. We've, we've got great replacements for players to come in, more so in the midfield and the attack. But yeah, we still need to look at things in the summer. So, I'm not. There's a scouting list getting prepared. 100%. You know, it has aye. been all season. Yeah. That, that'll be getting put into action. Yeah, so Andrew's speaking post-match, so quote-unquote, he says, we need to use this disappointment today to fuel what's going to happen in the next few games. And that'll absolutely be the message. You know, there's no doubt there was, there was disappointment in that dressing room. A lot of them will be feeling it in the same way that, that we feel it. You know, there's you know such high hopes and anticipation, but you can't spend too long dwelling on it. You know, you can't get caught up in it be done by now. feeling sorry for yourself. You just need to put it under your feet, move on to the next, and there's, there's lots to look forward to. It's a different story if you've got nothing to play for. We've got everything to play for and, and that's a bigger picture. I also think on that general point, it's definitely not the time for knee-jerk reactions and, and throwing players under the bus. I would have first agree. I don't think Jota, 
Rodic, Abada, for example, had had good games at all yesterday. But they've made such a massive contribution to this season so far that you need to give these guys the the respect and credit they deserve. Rodic was a hero two weeks ago. Maybe he's done. <laughs> All that kind of chat. We've seen phenomenal stuff from Jota. Abada's goal scoring and his assists numbers are fantastic. So yeah, they were poor and it's easy to get caught up and get frustrated. But you can't just take away all that good work previously and say that's them. Yeah, agreed. Totally agreed. Um, and I think it is a wee bit of knee-jerk, knee-jerk reaction kicking in from a lot of fans. And I, I kind of go back to, we're so used to kind of watching us go on and, and win these trebles. But that only shows yesterday how difficult a job that is to go and do. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's... Um, we are well ahead of where we should be this season and I just think we need to remember that. You're saying Neil Lennon doesn't get the credit he deserves for those trebles, <laughs> Absolutely <Barry>. not. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not, he doesn't get credit? No, he does not get credit. <laughs> <laughs> Add that to the showreel. Oh. Um, time to get comfy, folks. We're about to discuss the referee, uh, Bobby Madden. So, very genuinely, uh, we try not to make this show one where we're constantly moaning about refs and, you know, the decisions they make or don't make, but... I think he's just, he's made it very hard for us not to, to discuss it. Interestingly, I think, I watched the highlights last night and they barely touch on the referee. That tells you a lot that they don't want to talk about and it. And I think, I've got to be honest with you, I think, so Jane Lewis was hosting, I think she's very fair-minded, Simon Donnelly, Celtic-minded, and I've got to be honest with you, I don't think Kenny Miller's the worst, right? There's ones out there that are, I think Kenny Miller's fairly fair. Aye. But there's somebody somewhere who's directing what happens within Aye. that show. Talk about this, talk about that, talk about that. They just didn't even say it. There wasn't even a, what do you think of some of those decisions? Yeah. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Zero on the referee, which is just criminal, given the fact that everyone else seems to be calling them out. And there's a number of articles today, although they're just call- calling them out for having a general bad game. Not that he's made numerous horrendous decisions against Celtic. It's just a, I had a poor game in general. I don't think it's quite that. I'm in a situation, so we're at the game with my dad, who's also James's dad, mm-hmm. and... He says to his pre-match, my only worry is Bobby Madden. And I'm saying, listen, you, you listen, need to listen, take listen, that okay. <laughs> The game's moved on. right? <laughs> and I'm saying, I was saying that basically I thought that at times Madden could be incompetent, but I didn't think that he was biased. I didn't think he was a cheat. I thought he just made some poor decisions at times. I'm revising that, uh-huh. right? Because you cannot watch that yesterday and you've watched it back in full and I might do that at some point, but some of it just beggars belief. That I mean, I, I've, got, I've got my top three here. You've, I think you've got a list okay, as long I, as you are. Top, yeah. But my top, top three, <laughs> feel, feel top free to add your own here, Paddy. Uh, John Lindstrom uh, still hasn't been booked for his display yesterday. He's cutting about with no yellows for that. I bet you somebody told him after the game, you know you didn't get booked. He's like, no, I must have done. He's booting things, he's sliding in, he's challenging the keeper when he's trying to kick it out. Take your pick. Zero yellow cards for John Lindstrom. And that just gives you free reign. You see it at all levels of football. See if you get away with a few, you go, I can but do a few not? more of these. Yeah. I can leave the boot in here. And it allows him just to continue doing that. I think he went off 102 minutes in, I've seen. So 100 minutes without a yellow card. Incredible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Had to stop myself with swearing there, James. Incredible. <laughs> um, other wee incident. Aribo goes down injured in the Celtic box. Uh, Hart's looking to break quickly. Madden stops the play. Goes out to see him. Even picks him up. Quite nice. Ah, picks yeah, him yeah. up. Mm-hmm. Make sure he's okay. You okay, mate? You okay, right? You want a wee water? Later on, um, I think it was Aribo, ironically, wipes out Juranovic Medea. Yeah. Sore one, lands heavy on When he's step. on a booking. Is that right? Yeah, aye, yeah, will be aye. the time. Uh, no stop and play there. Rangers break, have a good chance of goal. And I think it's the one where McGregor actually picked up a booking for trying to clip he did. Uh, Kent. B- without touching Kent? Yeah, I think he tried to touch him, so fair enough. Kind of thing, I know, defending Bobby. Uh, third worst, the worst one for me um, was, I think, 117 minutes in. Uh, inexplicably, I won Rangers a free kick when I think he'd already given it to Celtic. Yeah. Turnbull zips out to Jota, genuine chance. Better stop that, ah, pulls it back. He runs up with the play after exactly. the free kick. It's, it's so obvious. Like, oh, they're in here. No, bring it back. And that, that <laughs> you know, th- just those take those three points out of my top 40, right? <laughs> the BBC decide that even those three points, even that one point about Turnbull's you know, uh-huh. free kick, that's not worth talking about because it is the strangest thing I've ever seen in a game of football. They've got an extended show there. There's there's not half a dozen games to show. There's yeah. our game and the, the Hibs Hearts game. So you've got plenty of time to cover all the deep talking points. Uh-huh. And I, I, honestly, I'd like, call me paranoid, call me what you want, but there's somebody somewhere at the BBC saying, don't show that, don't show that. We'll, we'll just focus on these things. Uh, I'm not on Instagram, Paddy, but if I was, I'd be going on to Bobby's page after that nonsense as well. So he's... But to put watch out, him happy Easter. He's put out a... I got to say a tweet, that's not Instagram. He's put out a, a gram. Um, <laughs> a post. Easy now. So he's put out a post, uh, post-match. Ha- happy Easter, folks. Hope you're having a great Sunday or some pash like that. Uh, his buddy Chris Boyd, oh, great, great stuff, Bobby. 
And I just think, listen, I'm not going to call guys out for having a life out, out with football and, you know, social media, do what you're doing, but have just a wee bit of savvy, just a wee bit of emotional intelligence. He is Gavin Savvy. Yeah. That's just the next generation painting the crown. Yeah, but that's that, all is. My, my take on it was that's the digital version of going to the crown with John Beaton after the game. He just knows that stirs con- controversy. And I'm sure his bosses at the SFA would say, Willie, well, come on you. They should be saying, what are you thinking? I mean, what's your take on it overall, Paddy? Have I, have I just gone too deep there? Have I... No, no, no. Uh, listen, I think the full Celtic M was baffled with some of the decisions yesterday. Um, what I was talking about with the first half with Rangers and just how they slowed everything down. We're talking about Tavernier with the corners, stuff like that. That was all allowed to happen. It was all allowed to happen for a reason, in my opinion. It worked hand in hand with how that, that first half went. The tackles from a lot of the Rangers players and the Celtic players were heavy. There was also a few heavy ones that were a let go with, with some of the Celtic players as well. Um, but Do you want what, to make my list it? Say again? Do you want to make my list Oh, it'll be very small, I know that. <laughs> but like, I, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is, is that I still don't like going back onto these things and saying that that's the reason we lost. However, the performance from Bobby Madden yesterday was shocking. But, but when that, I, I agree with you. If, if, you're, if you're looking external to solve your problems, you're not fixing stuff internally, yeah. right? That, that, that's my premise in most things. But when that, Refereeing performance stops you performing mm-hmm. you know, the way you play football yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's against the rules of the game. It's pretty difficult not to have a look at it. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Some, I, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, you've seen a lot of like ex-players, ex-Celtic players kind of bring, bring it up on social media about the, the level of the performance and, and calling it out for what it is. It'll be forgotten about within a week because yeah. that's just the football and country that we live in, sadly. Next time you hear about it, it'll be when Madden's doing the... After dinner circuit. <laughs> I mean, two, two things can be true in isolation. Celtic didn't perform yesterday. Mm-hmm. They fell short of their own high standards, as I've mentioned. And in addition to that, Bobby Madden has just... People have described it as a Madden masterclass. And there's nothing heavy, right? He's not called off Celtic's goal. He's not given Rangers a penalty. All the kind of obvious ones. It's more insidious. But it's that kind of uh, micro situations across the game. Not allowing the flow of the game. Pulling wee things back. Just, just wee things which add up to a bigger picture. So... I don't want to dwell any more on it, but it's just, as you say, Paddy, where does it go? Because there's not going to be any sort of anybody looking into it. He might get a slap in the wrist and he might, he might get taken off the big games for a couple of games and then he's back in and then it's it's as you were. I mean, you, as I say, you watched it back, James. Is there anything else of note that you want to pick up on in that display or is it just something we just need to put behind us and move on? I, I think it's more a broader point. I, mean, I, could, I could give you a list of another dozen, but it's the broader point and we spoke about this on the show throughout the season maybe even, you know, last season, what game do we want to export to the world? What do we want to show, you know, as a footballing nation? Why is it taking Scotland so long to get to a, a proper tournament? Because we allow this kind of crap football or crap standards of officiating to go on and there's no consequences. Mm. You know, why why not, you know, first of all, professional referees, find a sponsor, pay for it. You know, there's talk about VAR, all these things. But even if you're not, what's the consequences for having a bad game? And it's not like castigating guys. I don't think there's any real benefit from sending a guy down to, you know, second division stuff, train him, train him, show him how to be yeah. better. And if he constantly can't be better, just say, you're not going to be a referee, that's enough of that. Yeah. But let's have guys who are accountable and they play to a high standard. We saw in the Euros here in the summer, the referees and VAR were a positive contribution to the game mm-hmm. and they can be here as well, but they're not. And we're talking about referees when we should talk about football. Yeah, true. VAR don't stop that for yesterday though. You know, the, no. the, the, the decisions No, but it's made. part of the puzzle. Yeah, part uh, of, but you know, it's all wee things that, that VAR wouldn't have helped with. So that that style of refereeing that Madden's adopted yesterday could still be allowed to play out. Is it's he just, training for next year? <laughs> getting his practice in. Just to confirm basically what you were saying though about like, you know, the, the, the standard of the refereeing in the, the Euros last year backed with VAR. It even just goes back, I don't know if you heard about, I, I don't know who said it, but apparently two two people on Sports Sound both said yesterday they're sending offs in Europe. Aye. Yeah. But because it's... Here Scott. we allow that a bit more. Right. So, so why do we so backwards? Yeah. So backwards. So why is Scotland's record, you know, club record yeah. in Europe so poor in the last, uh, you know, twenty years, whatever kind of thing? Because you're not playing the same standards. Yeah. One wee final thing about the ta- some of the tackles yesterday, and working on about uh, Lundstrom, and um, there seems to be a lot of people raving about a uh, 50-50 on Callum McGregor. Yeah. Who won it? Who won it? Who won Aye. the ball? And, and it who, went who up went to... Aye. Just uh, That's wild, nuts. wild. You can't argue with stupid, Paddy. That's just, <laughs> that's very that's true. just the way that goes. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, let's put the game done, right? We've had our discussion on that. We've had our discussion on Bobby Madden and, and his carryings on. So 
that is behind us. And I think, you know, very positively, we have so much to look forward to. And I think that's to take even, you know, I've quoted Ange there and, and Callum McGregor. I've got a quote of his just coming up here. And we mentioned before coming on air the, the post-match huddle. Now, we're walking out of the stadium and you're, you're down and all that kind of stuff. But you glance around and you see that's going on. And I think a number of folks stopped to applaud that. Yeah. And, you know, gutted as you are, you know, let's not kid on that that wasn't sore yesterday, but gutted as you are, you've seen and had to respect what this team are trying to do. And, they're, you know, they've, they deserve all the plaudits going, you know, 33 games unbeaten domestically uh, and the, the sheer turnaround in what was meant to be a transitional season. So I think they deserve that credit. And I think it was an important move by McGregor. You know, I don't know if it's something he'll have thought about. I'm sure he wasn't considering losing a game, you know, but in the moment after we have lost it, he's thought, I need to get these players because he could see his teammates were down. That's a sign of real positive emotional intelligence, intelligence and I think it's a moment that could really galvanise these players for the last you know, five games that, that remain. So I'm going to quote McGregor after the game. Um, There's five games to win the league and that's what we have to do. We have to regroup, go again, take the disappointment, we accept it. It's never nice, it feels horrible, I can tell you. In there, brackets the dressing room, everyone's devastated We're but we've got five games to win the league and that's where we have to go. We have to go again. Harness all the good stuff we've done this year and learn from that. Take that forward. We've got a big finish to the end of the season. This is one of the few times we've had a bit of a slap in the face, so it's important that we show everyone to react in the right way. That's all we can do now. It's gone. You can analyse the game or whatever, but the fact is it doesn't come back. We have to regroup. We'll talk about it. But ultimately, we're looking at the end of the season and we want to make it a successful season. Next week at Ross County becomes our biggest game of the season. We have to go there and win. And I think if you were scripting it for a movie, that is the message. And that's the way McGregor and his teammates need to look forward. That's done. And there's tomorrow. So he's, he's getting them, you know, not even having tonight, tomorrow morning, right now, get that behind you, get focused next week. Because you can fall into these, you know, traps of, you know, just feeling a bit sorry for yourself and, and whatever. No, maybe we're not as good as we think we are and all that stuff. It's dead simple. You go in there, you go in the week after, the league's done. So he's getting them just properly reset. Like, like players do on the park, mm -hmm. he's getting them reset for the next game. Yeah, good to hear it. Yeah. Paddy, as James says, it's not a time for, for feeling sorry for yourself. You don't get anything for that. And really the players just need to, you know, dust themselves down, look at where we are and roll up the sleeves for the challenge of these next five games. Yeah, I, I still think we'll win the league. Honestly, I, I, I look at yesterday as a blip. Um, we had the games, obviously, we've, we've dropped points this season. And we've responded very, very well after them. Um, that's a sore one to take. I'm not going to deny that. But I just think there's still enough in the tank and the games that we've got coming up to just go and just solidify our, our lead in the league. But I don't see us crumbling. I really don't. I think that the mentality is there for this team to go and win it. I think that's been part of the need here because on the back of such a you know a sore result as yesterday, in the immediate aftermath, people are saying... What's the wee gift of the wee Rangers guy? It's done, it's done, right? We've got Celtic fans saying it, it's done, it's done. You know, that that's us now kind of thing. There's several guys on Twitter, guys that we're aware of that have tweeted us at different times and sent in messages. And they, they're they probably just couldn't wait for the I told you so. And so, and there's also some people who should know better on Twitter as well. And they sat me a bag of cans and got all excited, but there's, there's, there's just so much of this going on. And I think this, you know, team of players, a squad of players and Ange Postacoglu, just deserve far much more respect than they've got from some quarters because to go unbeaten for 33 games at any level of football is incredible. Mm -hmm. 33 games, you know, you've remained unbeaten and it's put us exactly where we are and now is just not the time for those overreactions. No, we need to back them. There can't be any frustration setting in at the end of the games. I'm actually, in a sense, a wee bit happy that the game's at Ross County next week um, because sometimes you kind of feel that after a defeat like that, sometimes Parkhead can get just a wee bit anxious if especially if you're if not you half an hour, 40 yeah, minutes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we just go and put a performance, um, on against Ross County, and you know, just uh, we've got plenty in the tank left. We really do. Um, I'm not, I'm not worried at all. Um, I just think that we've got a, we've now got a week to look at what went wrong, mm -hmm. how it went wrong. But we, we know that if we play our game and, and on our day, we can beat anyone in that league. Yeah, I mean, there's a wee bit of perspective in terms of we didn't have any of our strikers. Start. Yeah, do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that, that's just you know nobody really to talk about that kind of thing. You no. just go on with it, and that's fine. But Jack and Marcus is back for next Saturday. Kyogre came on, and you could tell he wasn't you know fit to play any ninety minutes. Never mind one twenty. I think he was strapped up as well. Um, so for me, I think it's going to look like the next few games anyway will be Jack and Marcus starting. Kyogre last half hour, that kind yeah. of stuff. Do you think Jack and Marcus will be fit? I've not heard that's any the talk, confirmation. Aye. Aye. He said he, yeah. he should be ready for next week. Yep. 
that would be a huge bonus because, you know, it's clear how much we missed him. And it's yeah. funny because when Kyogo was doing his thing at the start of the season and Jack Amakis was in the wings, you would never have considered that Jack Amakis mm-hmm. would have been the better alternative. But you're right, you know, we've got into that game yesterday without a number nine. We've realised in recent weeks with some of his brilliance, and he was brilliant again yesterday, by the way, Dyson Maeda uh, is a phenomenal addition to our team, but he's not a centre forward. Yeah. You know, he's, he's coming in off the left and everything he offers there. So... And he's clearly seen that Kugel wasn't match fit. Mm-hmm. And he was right. Yeah, he, was totally he, right. He, he wasn't as sharp as he can be. And that can be a huge reason why it's not quite worked out for us uh, yesterday. But it's a huge plus to potentially go with Kyogo as backup to Jack and Marcus yeah. on Sunday coming. So it's Sunday, not Saturday. It's Sunday at 2.30. Uh, Rangers play before us against Motherwell at 12 o'clock. Just in terms of Ross County, James, um, it'll be a tough test. They're targeting Europe. They've done brilliantly well to end up in the top six. Are they fourth just now? They're in the top six anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know, chasing European football. It certainly won't be easy. And from their point of view, you know, maybe they'll think this is a good time to get us in the back of a, a poor result. They're there for a reason, you know, and people had low expectations of Mackay, but he's an experienced coach. He's got a lot of other things that don't go for him, but he's, he's got a lot of experience as a coach and he's got a lot of good players there and they're committed players. You know, you saw them when they got that uh, draw against Rangers how committed they were to play the 90 minutes. Yeah. You know, that that's the kind of a lesser team lets their head go down there and say, we're a bottom six team, we'll fight it out and make sure we stay safe. A winning team goes, no, no, we can go for this. Mm-hmm. So that mentality carries out the team and that's what we'll need to overcome on Sunday. I think we will be up for it. It's going to be a stern test. I think even if Kyogo was fit, Jack Amakis is your guy there going up against, you know, a bunch of big farmers, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah big lumps of wood at the back. Uh, what about that, Paddy? So tough fixture, as, you know, as James is chatting about there. What changes do you think he makes for that one? G- given that it's, you know, it's a tighter park, it might be a, you know, a more physical game in general. Mm-hmm. Do you anticipate many changes? And obviously we don't know how fit Juranovic, Taylor, Carter Vickers was hobbling a wee bit towards Just the cramp. end. Just so cramp. anything that would stand out for you as obvious changes? Um, I wouldn't really change much. I th- I, a few of the guys have been talking about Hatati, maybe needs a rest. Um, Who for? Well, they're, they're, they're the bull, chatting. get the bill on. Uh, I don't know. I have, Are we having that one? You want to have that debate? Let's have that, right? Be- so before that, they were saying about O'Reilly possibly going in next to Big Tam. I don't think that. <sighs> works. I, love, I love O'Reilly. I just think Tam can, as much as it, it's funny, take Tam's performance yesterday in complete isolation. Oh, yeah, he can normally handle the the kick and rush kind of stuff yep. that he gets, and I think he will be a better fit for next yeah, Sunday. I think yeah. so. I'm not sure though, t- t- is what you were leaning to there, Paddy, is if Rodgers and O'Reilly can work together. I'm really no, not convinced I'm not sure. No, that. the double X, no. Th- th- <laughs> there was a point uh, ahead of Rangers' second goal. You'll have seen it when James Forrest is labouring to get back. He he is labouring, but he's also overtaken O'Reilly. Mm-hmm. And that's the point that's missed by a lot. Everyone's so I thought O'Reilly took a knock you know, in, in the, at some point in extra time. I don't know, but he was jogging at that point and it doesn't matter if you take a knock, you bought to get back. And yeah, I just yeah. thought... Everyone's quick to criticise James Forrest and we, you know, we've spoken about him and debated James back and forth at different times here. But he's offered so much to the club and I think, again, like many of the guys just now, he does deserve the respect to get himself back sharp and different things. Mm-hmm. We've seen, a, you know, a re- rejuvenation. Is that the right word, James? I'm going with it. Of Tom Rogic. Resurrection. Right. <laughs> we'll go, we'll resurrection. go resurrection see it since that time. <laughs> um, and James Forrest deserves a chance, you know, for that to be the case. But people are very quick to look at clips in isolation and go, ah, oh, James Forrest. There's other guys around that can help James Forrest. Now, he wasn't good yesterday. There's no point in papering over the cracks there. But there's other things at play. But in terms of Celtic's midfield, yeah, so so let's have the debate we were talking about uh, before coming on. I think David Turnbull's got a huge part to play in this Celtic team. I also tr- trust Ange's judgment better than Moan, and Ange saw fit to play him every single time he could in terms of, you know, the games he was available pre-season. Uh, sorry, before his injury. You lads aren't quite convinced. You don't think he fits into Ange's 4-3-3. I'll let you go first because I know it means a lot to you. So what's your take on it? I think he's a huge talent and I've I've loved his... I was really disappointed when he got the injury, didn't come to us and then you know, that all worked out in the end. And he was the shining light last season, he really was. And a di- totally different team, a totally different formation, different management, all that kind of stuff. I think he has a great talent and I think wherever he plays, he'll be able to do well as long as it fits his style of play. I genuinely think he's a square peg in a round hole in a 4-3-3. Simple as that. I think he likes having a broad midfield, 3-5-2, 4-5-1, whoever it may be. And we saw, I can't remember, it was one or two games this season where we switched to that just temporarily to end a game and it really clicked in for him. Mm -hmm. I just think a 4-3-3 passes him by. It's too fast. He can't stand up to the physicality of it. He's got all the skill in the world. I just think it's just not the right formation for him. 
What attributes do you think Rio Hatati has that David Turnbull doesn't have? He's a he's maybe a better thinker. He's, he's maybe a bit braver. I yeah. think he goes in for challenges that Turnbull doesn't. And those two things alone can I get him. I think Hatati's got a lot of work to do, by the way. Yeah, Hatati to to a degree, and this is unfair. He's riding on some really important goals for us, and he's played a lot of football between Japan and Scotland. So he's getting a wee bit of a an easy ride. He's got a big summer ahead of himself to, to get ready to really be an Ange player. I think they're totally different players entirely. I don't think they are too dissimilar. That's why I asked the question there. I think they're they're both technically gifted. You know, you know, they're both you know very good on the ball. And I think Turnbull certainly, maybe fairly at times, has been accused of having a lack of engine, a lack of energy. But I think you've got to appreciate coming back from a, a big injury that maybe it might take time for him. To, I mean, he, he won't be anywhere near his peak as a footballer. He's 22 years of age. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for a player to develop, then surely under a guy like Ange Postacoglu is, you know, is where you might see him flourishing. But you, you kind of just answered my, like we, we, you basically said my answer to what you're talking about. I painted him. myself in a corner. <laughs> you have a wee bit. <laughs> Hide myself in knots here. You're talking about him just coming back for this injury. So mm -hmm. why why would we risk that in these five games? And I, I, I know Hattati's possibly not at the the peak. They kind of, we've we seen him coming in all, all guns blazing and he was looking great. I just think he's a bit more riskier. I think he's a bit more slicker on the ball than what Tumble is. And I think that can definitely come from David Tumble, but it needs to happen this summer. I don't think it's going to happen in the this five, five I get games. you, and, and, and I agree. I'm not quite uh, banging the drum for it to start these next five mm -hmm. games. You know, very important, very crucial. We can't take any risks. We can't have any passengers. Not that he's a passenger, no. but, you know, maybe wrong choice of words there, but... I think in the bigger picture, I think there's a huge part to play, uh, you know, and Ange Postacoglu is Celtic. And I think a proper pre-season for mm -hmm. a guy, you know, he got thrown into that Neil Lennon team, which was, you know, really struggling at the time. And he showed real maturity, scored some brilliant goals and he scored plenty of goals for Celtic this season. And I just think with the right pre-season and the right coach and the right development, he's, he's 22, I think. Yeah. Maybe the 23, 24, 25 year old David Turnbull is a real star. I, I, I'm, I'm sticking up for him. I think he's got to be something. I, I think he'll be a star. In a Celtic team that isn't four three three or elsewhere, I think you'll have a huge future in football. And I think you're right. You know, let's let's see if we can, you know, whip him into the the formation this summer. And and this is the big chance. You know, I, I'd I'd love nothing more than Turnbull to make it to Celtic. I just hope he stays fit. That seems to be the wee worry with him. Um, injuries. And I hope he's just he's not too really injured. One, you know, apart from coming back from his injury, he's only had that one. I know, a little bit like that's a big one with, with, with the injury he had with his knee. I think that's mm -hmm. that's a big one. And then obviously to do the hammy, that could be the beginning of a... He played something like 34, 35 games by yeah, that time, you yeah. know, played a lot yeah. of football. It's just, you know, a big injury like the knee one can play on players' mm -hmm. mind. And I would like to think and hope that he's got the right um, support. And I don't know what kind of, sports you know, psychology. sports science and psychology, you know, provide in terms of just at some point he needs to get his head away from that. And maybe he has got his head away from that. Maybe we are... You know, question it. Maybe he's maybe he's moved on there. So no. listen, we'll revisit this one. I don't know. Let's call it October once the season starts. Once he had a few games, not at West Ham when he's starting for Celtic in the Champions League. Um, <laughs> anyway, moving on. I went on Sunday, Paddy, uh, followed by a positive result against Rangers at Celtic Park the week after. Uh, it would be on the verge of reclaiming the league title, yeah. and it's it's as simple as that. And it's important that we continue to focus on that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll go back to the the. Basically, what we've been talking about every week in this show, I think Ange will continue with this one game at a time approach. Um, Ross County's a big game on Sunday. Um, they're in the top six for a reason, as we've touched on. I just think that we should be too much for them. Um, and I'd, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly confident about getting up there and, and getting the result. I definitely think they'll want to put what happened yesterday to bed and just say, no, we're, we're top of the league for a reason. And they are. Yeah, I think in, based on what we know of this group of players, they would play the game tomorrow. They'd be desperate yeah. to, you know, to get to the game. And that's the joy of football. You know, you never have to wait too long before there's a chance to redeem yourself and, and deal with a lot of the negativity. Mm -hmm. James, some bigger picture stuff. So, you know, we've spoken about the fact that this is or was meant to be, you know, a season of transition and rebuilding. And, you know, I think, you know, you can roll back the tapes and listen to what we were saying, you know, as soon as Ange came in. And it was all about, let's just make sure we're challenging. Let's put up some sort of competition. Cups would be a bonus and all that stuff. But there's no doubt that that feeling's changed. And, and I think there's just no doubt that Ange's got his way, way ahead of, of where we should be this time. Absolutely. I mean, part of it is the attitude Rangers had coming into this season. 
thinking that that gap was real, that 25, 25 point gap was real. Mm-hmm. And they found out even the game they beat us at Ibrox that it wasn't. And we were, we were coming, you know, up pretty fast. So there's been a, for Ange to get that amount of football knowledge, changing system, and it's so many players in such a short space of time. I don't think that's, I think there's been an element of luck in there because I don't think you can repeat that. You can't put that in a textbook and say, this is what you do. There's been a lot of stuff that's just went, this player has clicked, that player's clicked, and it's all just come together. We're way, way ahead of where we should be. This, this should have been, as much as I thought we'd always get the league, which would be challenging and you know, we could put them for the league. It was really about what was this team going to do next season. So, like I say, leak up in the bag, you know, potentially a, a league coming. I'm just delighted where we've got to this season and it's going to be really interesting to see a full summer of Ange training and coaching, augment the squad with a you know, few changes, guys will leave, guys will come in, all that stuff and let's see where we're at the start of next season and we'll really kick on because we're passing them in the stairs. I'd like to see what they do in the summer. Yeah, yeah very interesting. Um, I mean, Paddy, we, we touched on it briefly as well. There's no doubt that, you know, from a Celtic point of view, we see what we see on a Saturday. You know, we see the game stuff. We, we hear Ange pre and, pre and post-match. We hear the players talking. But there's no doubt there's a huge amount of work going on behind the scenes. I'd be amazed if Ange hasn't had conversations, spoke to players, spoke to agents, identified the guys he wants. And that's a big thing, isn't it? Because, you know, as mentioned, we, we anticipated this being a, a season of transition. We're way past that. And I think Ange is already a couple of steps away from where we are thinking. He doesn't think... This team's not bad. We've got a strong chance to win the league. Yeah. We've got to the semi-finals of the Scottish. He's way more ambitious than that. Yeah. And in a very positive way, he sees Europe as a real yardstick. That's where you measure yourself, you know, against the best of the best. And I think the byproduct of doing well in Europe is that, you know, you should be strong and, you know, dominating your own your own league setup. So mm-hmm. you'd be amazed if he wasn't doing all that kind of work in the background and prep for what's to come next season. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've seen just the, the benefit of him this season and some of the steals we've had from the J-League. Um, you know, just to take that gamble for bringing players in uh, to come and play in a different style of football, I'm not in any way disrespecting the J-League, especially after some of the players we've seen this season come into our league. But what I'm saying is it has a different style from how we play. But watching these guys embed themselves in, into our, our style of football, some of them doing it quicker than others, obviously, but... To take that risk in your first season as well and and be confident and assured enough in the decision to go and say, that's the market I want to touch, that's what I want to get. And some of these comments I remember around the end of the first transfer window and also just before the winter transfer window was like, oh, I'm not just looking at Japan, there's other there's other yeah, nuggets in. I, I, and uh, it was, I think it was, we were linked with an, uh, an Iranian winger. Um, just stuff like that is very, very exciting for us. And... We've all had the debate about uh, Jota and, and Cameron Carter Vickers and who who would you sign if you're only given one. I generally, I, I always kind of thought about Carter Vickers definitely being the player I want and I still kind of stand by that. But if we were not to get either of them, I, I think we will identify players, two or three players in each position, to be honest, ready to come in and and, and get, make this team stronger. Um, we still need more players in our squad. I think, um, and it's exciting to see what he has lined up. I bet I do think it'll be a good summer. I think so, and I think there's no doubt that his supporters, there's real confidence in Andy's ability to spot a player. Yeah. We remember the kind of burnt out quote of Peter Lawwell saying, ah, but Lenny knows a player. I'm not sure about that, right? No, I'm sure he doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> but of the, what is it, 15 odd players that Andy signed. Sorry, to be fair, Lenny, they're... He wasn't signing a lot of these players himself. He was getting given those players. So. Yeah. Sorry. There's a bit of that. Yeah. Sorry, Lennon. <laughs> Sorry, Lennon. Sorry, Celtic. Thanks for tuning in, Neil. <laughs> um, but the... Uh, where are you? You've thrown me. Where was it? Where was <laughs> Sorry, I Neil Lennon. <laughs> yeah. I think that, you know, the, of the 15-odd players that Ange signed, I'm not getting the finer details now, but about 12 of them have been a success. You know, there's been so much good stuff going on there. And to get 12 out of 15 right is seriously strong. And there's that confidence from a, a fan point of view that you know that whoever he brings in, there's a high probability they're going to hit the ground running. But the most important thing is I think this board have bought into him. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they, you know, took his advice on going to Japan and signing three guys at the end of December, start of January, and they've had that belief in it to say, OK, mm-hmm. we've worked with you for a few months. We're going to do this and we're going to back him. That is so, so important for the manager to have that relationship with the CEO. So Michael Nicholson, Nicholson is obviously the man in charge at the moment. And that that confidence that they have in him has got to be a positive moving forward into what he wants to do this summer. 
Absolutely, and it wasn't just signing the three, the three guys from Japan. It was signing them first of January. Aye. You know, it was, it was the let's not mess about like we have done in the past. Hi, Peter. Um, you know, because it it just it, it's not about getting guys in the last day of the window. It's about getting them into the squad and getting them trained into the game and stuff. So that link between Ange and the boardroom, long may that continue as as a strong link and a moving forward together. It's the first time in years, maybe ever that I've felt Celtic management and Celtic owners, board, whatever, are moving in the same direction. And there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of things to be fixed at Celtic, an awful lot. But that's one thing that we've got seems to be working well. Have you yeah. we, we ever signed or bought a player on the 1st of January? The only one I'm maybe thinking about is Lundberg. But I don't even was know he if that... Was he a free agent? Aye, aye. Have we ever done that? That, that went well. <laughs> I lo- uh, I love the Lenny saying that. No, I see all this gamesmanship and take it oh, up to the brink. And it's nineteen sixties negotiation. I, it really I, is. I'm too tired to be sitting up to midnight watching Jim White or whoever <laughs> replaced Jim White. That was just too long for me. But I think there's just there's clearly a plan, and that's you know going back to it. Just that's what gives me such confidence that there's so much work going on just now. And credit to Ange for being the juggler that he is because he's got to take teams to cup semi-finals and challenge for the league and go on 33 game unbeaten runs and motivate players and speak to the press and different yeah. things and also build and there's no doubt that in the background the stuff that we don't see is going on and there's no man you'd rather have doing it Paddy No absolutely and I, I do think that the pressure after what happened last summer and that transfer window there I do think the pressure will be kind of relieved a bit for him in that process Not in his head well, what I'm meaning is I think that he'll be able to point it out a bit more. Like, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're hoping for. A hundred percent will have the final say, though. You know, and that's, I don't think that's happened. Um, I don't definitely don't think that happened under Neil Lennon about the final say with a lot of players. You've probably gone back to Martin Neil since that last time. Yeah, possibly, you know, and, and even then, maybe not the last year and a half. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that, to have that with the the board that we've, we still have, because I don't think it's changed much after obviously the, the Don McKay debacle, but to be able to be in that position and feel confident and strong enough that you are calling the shots, not something that's actually seen a lot in, in uh, world football now, to be honest, mm. because of the amount of roles that have, have popped up over the days. Um, but I definitely think that for him to be confident and take that risk, he's definitely the guy you want in charge. Definitely the guy you want in charge of your team. Yeah, I think as 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 the manager, there is he's a he's a bit of a chameleon. He, he, he's all things, you know. He, he's the manager, he's the coach, he's the arm around the shoulder guy, he's a sports science guy, he's the director of football. He he's he's doing so many roles, and I, I don't think there's any doubt that now that he's had his you know feet, you know feet under the table for what ten months or so, he'll also start to pick off some guys here, a sports science guy here, a, a scout here, and. And I just think we'll be in a very good place. You know, I, I imagine a full season of Ange prep and everything that comes with that. And we're just, you know, you know, touch wood and all that stuff. We'll get this, you know, league title over the line and we'll get to the Champions League. And it's just going to be such an exciting summer for Celtic in anticipation of all of that. It very much is. And I, I think you're right. I think there'll be personnel coming in behind the scenes as much as, you know, first 11 players and squad players. I think Ange seems the kind of guy that wanted to immerse himself in everything, you know, right at the start and find, find out for himself, not off of a report or someone telling him, find out for himself how youth is working, how sports psychology is working, how everything's working, and then say, right, okay, now I can start to hand that off to the right people. You know, he's, he's hired a few guys behind the scenes already and more of that will continue. But yeah, if it, I don't want to start getting excited about my summer until I've got a league trophy in my pocket. So <laughs> That's just true, James, this is true. So one game at a time, as Paddy says, and I'm sure that's the approach, but Aye. definitely exciting to look a wee bit further afield and see what's possible. Paddy, Sunday is done. Yep. That is off the table. We won't cover it again. That is done and dusted. And that's the way football's got to be sometimes. Highs and lows and all that stuff, but sometimes you just need to move on. Um, sometimes, not as much as, you know, maybe felt yesterday, but sometimes it's good to also come on here and, you know, run it through and, and just kind of dissect it and then you can put it to bed. So what's your final thoughts, uh, you know, for this week, you know, and the aftermath of all that's gone before, but what still lies ahead of us? Just dust yourself down and basically look at what you've achieved this this season. Um, I think that's enough for them. Uh, like I say, some of the results we've had over the year, a um, couple of draws, especially I think the St Mirren draw, I think a, f- a few of us were very deflated after that just before Christmas. But we, we, we've kept going. Um, we never stop. Oh, sweet as a nut. Perfectly timed. Thank you. Uh, James, over yourself, are you already over yesterday and looking forward to what's ahead? Absolutely. I mean, there's not a, a sane Celtic fan in the world that wouldn't swap yesterday's defeat for, would want to swap yesterday's defeat for the two wins in the league we've had of late. So that's football. You, you know, There's three games there. 
if you could have picked the two you're going to win, you'd have the two that you did win. So for me, Cup would have been nice. The league's where it's at. Get those two. Get Ross County on Sunday. Get Rangers a week after. And the league's done. I'll take that all day long, James. As Callum McGregor said post-match, the full focus now turns to Sunday at Ross County and to the five league games that remain for Celtic to reclaim the Scottish League title. Yes, the Scottish Cup loss will sting for a bit, but now's not the time for knee-jerk reactions or for Celtic to feel sorry for themselves after a first defeat of the year. It's time now to get right behind the squad of players who have fired us to the top of the table and to give them our complete backing from now until we pick up that Scottish Premiership trophy. And that's exactly what we'll be doing. Thanks to James and Paddy for joining me today and thanks to you for your continuing support of the Celtic Exchange. If you're enjoying what we do and want to help us spread the word, please help us do so by sharing this episode far and wide with your Celtic supporting pals. It really goes a long way to helping us do what we do. But in the meantime, and as always, thanks for tuning in. Hold up. 